Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our FOMO virtual guest speaker series. My name is Krishna Madiwala, and I'm the president of the Brondick chapter. Today, I am pleased to be joined by Mr. Kungalo, who's worked in cardiology and currently works as a hospitalist physician assistant. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Kungalo. What were some of the prerequisites that you had to complete before applying and kind of building your resume? So the same applied to, uh, you know, going to medical school. Uh, I don't remember everything, but in general, you want to have, uh, you know, for undergrad, uh, your, you know, your, your sciences, you know, biology one and two, chemistry one and two, uh, I think a year of physics, uh, you want to have your, uh, uh, at least calc or pre-calc, um, and uh, anatomy and physiology course, uh, biochemistry, so the general science is, oh, I forget, uh, organic uh, chemistry one and two as well. So those uh, are the prerequisites. Um, and with that, you know, people can really enter from any other um, uh, uh, majors, uh, so long as they have at least those uh, basic science courses uh, in their curriculum. And were there any specific classes that you might have taken in high school to prepare you for the physician assistant program? Absolutely. So the prerequisites, like I say, are the sciences. So if you were good in science, you know, in, in high school, uh, I did my high school in, uh, in in Belgium, in Europe. So it's a bit different here, but I imagine it's the same. Uh, so yeah, you guys, I'm sure you take chemistry, biology um, and you know, the physics uh, and math. So anybody who is taking any science focused sort of uh, curriculum in high school uh, should be well prepared to enter. Uh, the physician assistant uh, uh, world. And what did you have to do while you were training? Um, so, okay, tell me what, what you mean by that in term. Kind of like what, what were some things that you had to do or experience maybe like in the in the field itself when you were kind of getting your education and kind of getting your training? I guess, well, in order to enter, to become a physician assistant or to go to, to PA school, uh, they require that you have uh, some uh, healthcare background. Traditionally, the PA profession really was for people who, uh, you know, worked in the field for a long time, let's say a nurse or radiology tech, uh, who wanted to go into, you know, medicine, um, traditional medicine. Uh, that will come from that background. So I think now they still require, you know, I think, I, I'm not sure, uh, a few hours, I don't know how many really, to be honest, uh, of um, healthcare focused sort of work. Uh, hopefully that's what you're asking me. I'm not sure yeah. if I'm answering that question. Okay. <laughs> and um, how did you kind of decide that becoming a physician assistant was for you? Like, how did you, how were you able to make that choice? So it's, it's, it's different for everybody, right? For me personally, to be honest, I wanted to be a, a, a doctor, a physician uh, when I was, uh, you know, your age. Uh, and um, I really just stumbled upon the uh, physician assistant career, uh, you know, from people and also just doing research. Um, and I remember even, you know, buying a book on Amazon, uh, you know, how to become a PA or one of those books. And then read, and then I say, you know what? This really align, aligns itself with what I want to do. Um, the idea of going to school for many, many years um, uh, wasn't appealing at that time, and I, uh, I also was supporting myself. So I had put myself through college and through um, uh, grad school. So I just at that time didn't think that I could, you know, uh, fork the bill to put myself in medical school. So um, that's really how it came about for me. Uh, it was a kind of a calculated move, uh, but it's different for many people. Um, I think a lot of time now people are just, you know, people, are, you know, in your position are just, you know, focused, hey, I want to do, I want to go to PA school. But many of us um, before either came off from another career or found this path in order to, uh, as an alternative to go to medical school. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I totally understand that. And what was something that you might have not learned while you were kind of in your PA program or while you were getting your education, but you learned it while actively working at the hospital? That's a very good question. It's actually, there is a lot, uh, but I'm just going to pick on, uh, on a couple of things. 
Um, one is the business side of medicine. Uh, you don't really grasp the uh, the full force of you know how a healthcare system is uh, uh, structured in terms of payers and insurance until you are yourself in the field and you realize, oh, you can't do this procedure because so-and-so doesn't have insurance for it, or you can't do that because, uh, you know, they're paying out of pocket. Uh, the whole thing, uh, if you think you understand it now, it, it's going to be even more blurry <laughs> when you are in a field. So that is uh, just one aspect of it that, you know, comes to mind. Uh, but quickly also, just, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, in medicine, you deal with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, pain and tragedy and suffering. Uh, so one never really, nothing really prepares you to, to be able to be uh, in the middle of it and try to do, you know, a good job for your patient at the same time dealing with the emotional, uh, you know, burden of uh, what you see and, and, and what, you know, life throw at people. Kind of being able to support the patient while also trying to, I guess, process what happened. Exactly, exactly. And how is being a physician assistant different than being a nurse practitioner? So in practice, uh, there isn't really much of a difference. Uh, both physician assistants and PAs uh, oh no, and NPs, nurse practitioners, are considered uh, mid-level professionals uh, beyond uh, you know, the more advanced physicians. Uh, so in practice, really, I work, you know, hand in hand, same department with my uh, NP colleagues. Uh, there isn't, uh, the difference comes in, in a training uh, and the route, you know, to be an NP, obviously, you have to have been, uh, you have to, to be a, a nurse first and then go to, for the advanced training. And PAs, obviously, you know, have a different route. Um, so really, the difference really is in a title. Uh, and the training and some state requirements. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, in the words, in the hospital with patients, it really doesn't make a big difference, I don't think. Right, right. And kind of, I guess, moving away from the path to becoming a physician assistant and moving more into cardiology. Um, why did you choose cardiology? Well, why did you initially choose cardiology? Well, if I want to be honest, I did not choose cardiology from the outset. When I finished PA school, I, uh, I wanted to go into either surgery or emergency medicine. And back then, these were uh, difficult to get into, especially uh, emergency medicine. Uh, it required, they used to take people with, with experience. So I finished, I was, I was living in Delaware. I went to in school in uh, in Philadelphia, but I was living in, in Delaware. Uh, and, and after looking for a job for, uh, I think it was only three months, but it felt like, you know, forever. Uh, a colleague of mine had a job here in Baltimore and she was working in a cardiology department and then called me and say, Hey, we need help here. Are you interested in a job? I said, yes. <laughs> and then I never looked back since. So it kind of chose me. I didn't really choose it, but I was happy. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Yeah, that's the main thing, always being happy. And um, so what kind of skills are necessary for your job? So it was, as I was explaining to you guys, um, I uh, just for a little bit of background, I started off in cardiology uh, and up until I think three or four years ago, uh, I became a hospitalist uh, in the same hospital really that I was working at. Um, and your question is uh, what, what skills are required in order to be in cardiology or a PA or we could do both. Let's do both. Okay. So, you know, I think once you finish PA school, obviously these are the, you know, the prerequisite, right? You have to be to go to your training and, and then, you know, you get the job and you satisfy the, uh, licensing, uh, requirements to do your job. Uh, but what it takes, I think, in a field, you have to be compassionate uh, to take care of people. I think it will make you uh, in a great clinician. Uh, you also have to be a team player. Uh, medicine is really a, uh, a team game, uh, not just physicians and nurses, like we, we were talking a little bit briefly before this. Uh, but there was a whole host of people in the whole uh, universe of uh, healthcare or hospital. Uh, so you have to be a good team player. 
And um, you also have to be curious and, uh, and wanting to learn uh, every day because you will be challenged every single day. Uh, you know, there is the science and the art of medicine and both of it is nothing still. It changes all the time and you have to adapt. And so what is a typical day for you at the hospital? So a typical day is a typical night for me because I work uh, the night shift. I am what you call a nocturnist or um, uh, so the typical shift for me starts um, at 7 p.m. I uh, start at seven and get off at uh, seven in the morning. Um, so I guess I would go and uh, find my team, the people who work during the day and get what we call a sign out. Uh, so they will sort of tell me the lay of the land and uh, explain to me, uh, oh, well, I had, you know, X patient. I want you to follow up on X lab. Or they will tell you this person is sick. So keep an eye on them, you know, overnight. Um, so you get to this sign out. Uh, a typical census is, depending on where you are, uh, could be anywhere from 50 to 100 patients that you are responsible for. Uh, so they give me a pager. Obviously, I don't go around on all of them. And then, uh, so nurses are able to call you when anything is wrong with that patient to uh, deal with. Um, so that's one part of the job that we call, uh, you know, cross covering because you're covering patients that are not yours, but um, were there before. Um, and then also, uh, you get new patients that come that get admitted uh, at night. They come through the ER, they're having chest pain. The emergency doctor says, you know, you need to stay in hospital. So, you know, I come in and, you know, uh, and see them and figure out, you know, how to take care of them. And uh, these are the patients that I will take care of myself immediately uh, on top of the mass of patients that were already there that need to be, you know, kept healthy and alive until the next day. Right. So you always have to kind of be on your A game, always have to be alert and ready, ready to go, whatever it may be. Absolutely. You know, uh, I don't know if you guys, I don't want to make assumptions. I don't know if you guys know what pagers are. Uh, and so when I was growing up, that was the thing before cell phones. But uh, you carry a pager and it goes off anytime. You know, uh, it could be something as easy as uh, so and so needs Tylenol because they have a fever, or it could be so and so can't breathe and you need to come in and help them, or so and so looks like they're having a stroke and you have to come in and uh, and see them. And you could be in a basement of the hospital, and the the problem is all the way to the the top sixth floor. So you're always on the move. You're always on your A game, like you said. Um, you're always very attentive. And going back to your time, or going back to when we were talking about cardiology, during your time as a cardiology PA, were there any particular cases that stood out to you? Um, hmm. There were plenty of cases. Um, we saw, just in general, you know, you see a lot of uh, people with chest pain, uh, people with uh, myocardial infarctions, you know, heart attacks. Uh, congestive heart failure, um, and, uh, you know, many cases, um, I want to see if I can think of one that, maybe not one case that uh, stuck at me, but um, a class of cases, there are times where people have, um, you know, end-stage heart failure, where the heart really, really becomes so, so weak that it can't really handle the function you know, of pumping blood everywhere. So people become very sick, very weak, and they have um, multi-system, you know, um, failure. Um, and, uh, and seeing those patients, especially the younger ones, uh, I think there was a time where these were diseases, you know, for people that were older, uh, but, you know, seeing that in people in their, in their 20s, uh, that always, uh, I found that, you know, said at the same time. And, uh, and uh, you know, like you said, it kind of sticks there because um, it's kind of the reality and uh, it's it's very hard to, to deal with. Uh, one needs really heart transplant at that point. Uh, so cases like that, you know, uh, sticks and I always remember uh, those patients.
yeah and that's something that kind of i guess hard to get over and kind of hard to process as well yeah it's very difficult not that it's easy to see you know elderly people suffer or, or be sick but you know uh, maybe i think uh we are wired that way we always we know that you know people get old and they get weak and they um you know the, the heart also get weaker but to see someone who's younger than you or at least your age, um, you know, suffer from, from that, um, you know, can be a little bit uh, destabilizing, I think. And what kind of diseases or illnesses did you predominantly treat? So, you, you know, we used to see the bread and butter of cardiology, really, anywhere from, um, you know, heart attacks and uh, heart failure, and there is a class of diseases that we call um, arrhythmias. This is um, when the heart, um, you know, is beating at really abnormal, you know, rhythms, uh, atrial fibrillation and or SVTs or VTACs and things like that. Um, and uh, so these are the type of uh, conditions that we, we see, but really the big ones, like I said, those three have to be, and they're all a class of disease, right? Um, so between, like I said, um, you know, heart attack, ischemias, and, um, you know, heart failures and uh, arrhythmias, um, that was really most of it. Uh, maybe some are escaping me, but I feel like that's kind of the bread and butter. Right, right. And so since it's important to keep your heart healthy and kind of prevent these diseases do you have any tips or easy ways that people can improve their heart health especially in a situation like this or during a pandemic yeah keep moving <laughs> don't sit keep moving uh i think a healthy heart is uh uh you know obviously you know very important uh but you know physical activity uh getting out there you know getting the sun you know I have children, um, and uh, and now with the pandemic, like you said, everybody's cooped up at home, uh, and we're not getting the sun out there. So I always insist in trying to push my, especially my son, to go outside and and you know walk uh, and uh, exercise. You know, eat well. I think you know we can get very technical with these things, but if you just remember eating well and and exercising. And that will keep you going for a long, long time. Yeah, exercise and just get outside, even if it's yeah. for a little bit and eat, eat healthy, right? Absolutely, absolutely. At least 80% of the time. <laughs> yes, yes. And so we're going to move on to some viewer questions. Um, so have you done any interventional cardiology or in the cardiac cath lab? I have not myself, but I have sent many, many people uh that in that direction so my job would be let's say someone comes in i'm having chest pain and i go and assess them you know and we you know get an ekg we get uh some blood work that shows evidence of uh of impending you know heart attack uh so my job was to get them out to the cath lab quick uh so i'll get on the phone with the cardiologist interventional cardiologist uh, we used to do those intervention at the hospital, literally, you know, the, 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 um, the patient's, the ward, the patient's room was very close to uh, the cath lab itself. Uh, nowadays, the way my hospital is set now, we have to ship to send them to another hospital via ambulance. Uh, so from the time they come to the door to going to the cath lab, um, my job was really to make that time really, really short so they can go right away. Uh, and all the prepping that comes before before they go there, right? You know, uh, the diagnosis, the medications, and setting them on a way. Uh, I was involved with that, but not uh, myself um, doing a procedure. I've assisted or, or you know, uh, seen the procedures uh, in a cath lab, but I wasn't the one driving the... the uh, or, or leading yeah, so you, would just, so you would just kind of make sure that the patient is ready and prepped and just ready to go? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, medicated, ready. Uh, and, uh, you know, occasionally I'll go there and, you know, be able to see it. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. And how often do you work with the physician or are you usually working by yourself or independent? 
So it all depends, right, in uh, what it is that you do. Uh, you know, so going back to the the job of a physician assistant, you know, you can even tell in a word is physician assistant. So you were traditionally supposed to be the right hand man of the the physician, whether it's in in, in, in surgery or in cardiology. Uh, but the way things are set up now, you don't absolutely not have to be uh, side by side with your your supervising physician. In fact, I can't even uh, I don't remember the last time I saw my physician my, my supervising physician on paper, the one that actually signed off on my on my license, um, because it's such a teamwork. Uh, you know, hospitals are big, uh, and uh, your job may be to do a certain thing in a certain place of the hospital where, um, you know, you, but you are always able to call uh, on the assistant of the physician uh, if you need it. Uh, so people always throw the number that we can do up to, you know, 85 to 90 percent of what a physician does. Um, so that's a kind of a working number, but it all really depends on the setting. Right. So it's a little bit of both. Like you're working with the physician, you're working on a team, but you're also working by yourself. It's kind of oh, absolutely. Amazing. There's tons of autonomy. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just like you said, it, 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 it's a little bit of both. Right. And so how many different physicians do you work with? Uh, me personally now, uh, let's say on my team, uh, if I go to work now, there is always three PAs and two physicians at the same time. That's, uh, so we are the five people that literally uh, cover uh, all of the hospitalists, uh, all the patients really that are in the hospital in every given night. Uh, between admitting them and between responding to their needs, um, you know, in the middle of the night. Uh, it could be anything from, like I say, somebody's having a stroke, somebody's bleeding, or somebody's dying, or somebody's just not feeling well. Uh, so, yeah. And how challenging is it to work the night shift? And how do you kind of maintain your sleep schedule to keep yourself healthy? Uh, I wish I could answer that question uh, <laughs> because I find it very challenging. Uh, I think some people are just wired to uh, work night. Um, and, um, I was always one of those people. I never, I didn't start off, uh, at night, by the way, I, um, I started off, you know, day shift, but I never was a good sleeper. I would stay up all night and then wake up and go to, have to go to work, um, you know, in the morning and really struggle. And then when I saw the opportunity to go work night, it's kind of worked for me because I can stay up for, you know, long you know, for long periods of time without being tired. So that was kind of naturally that happened to me. But everybody has different ways of dealing with the night shift. It really just kind of the work in progress. But one thing that I know works is that the when you are off, try to get back on a regular sleep schedule. Like I worked last night, but I, I didn't sleep all day. Uh, I'm going to try to go to bed uh, at night so that, you know, I can get back to that schedule you know, in the next two to three days that I'm, that I'm off rather than playing catch up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of, I guess it's a mix of figuring out what works for you while also maintaining a sleep schedule that's somewhat normal. Yeah. And it's not just a sleep schedule too, you know, family life, right? Because you come home, you know, especially when my kids were younger, they expect you to be up and running during the day. You can't just sleep. You're like, dad, why are you sleeping all the time? Well, because I worked last night. Uh, but I want to play, you know, so you just have to sort of try to get back to normal schedule when you are off. Uh, that kind of helps, I think. Yeah. And so would you say that it was kind of a challenge to figure out what works best for you? Yeah. And it still is a challenge. Uh, you know, I've been on night for, you know, many years, uh, maybe 12, 13 years. Um, and uh, I still find it challenging. And uh, to be quite honest, um, I, I would love to switch back to day shift uh, in the next few years as my kids kind of get older. Um, so it is, it is always a challenge. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Oh Thank my you God, so much for that's it. <laughs> for, for taking the time out of your day to talk to us about your profession. And we really do appreciate your perspective. Before we do leave, do you have any final words of advice that you would like to leave? 
Yes. So like I say, if you want to get into healthcare, um, there are a lot of choices. It does not have to be PA. It does not have to be NP. It doesn't have to be a physician. It doesn't have to be a nurse. Uh, there is so much more. But one thing that uh, you need to have, I think you need to, uh, you love the sciences because it's still a scientific endeavor. Uh, you need to be hardworking and uh, you also need to be very curious uh, with everything that goes around you. Uh, so uh, that really is the message that I want to uh, leave with you guys. And to everyone watching, please stay tuned for our next guest speaker event to check out all of the future of human health and medicine organizations initiatives, including Teen Mental Health Night and the Healers podcast. Please visit FOMO.org. Thank you again to all of the viewers and have a great afternoon.